Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Deer Gear Podcast. Today, Dorch and I are talking about spine. This is an in-depth conversation about the spine of an arrow. We cover things like the first dynamic bend, dynamic spine, static spine, how to manipulate spine, and what spine arrow is right for you, and truly understanding what that means to the flight of your arrow and how to get the best possible performance. Before we get into this, guys, just a reminder, the Exodus Rival, the new cell camera from Exodus is for pre-sale right now. So if you go to the website, exodusoutdoorgear.com, you can purchase a budget-minded cellular trail camera that you can run in volume that's backed by the industry-leading no BS five-year warranty. It's an insane value at $179 for a cell camera that is guaranteed to work for you for five years. Also covered by theft and damage coverage so if the camera is stolen or damaged in a way that we cannot control, you will get a replacement camera for 50% off of the MSRP of that camera. If you are frustrated with the budget cell cameras that you ran last year now is a really great time to hop on the exodus rival train get them in your hands this spring test them out and then you'll know by fall that they are the camera for you so head to the website exodusoutdoorgear.com also while you're there sign up for the email newsletter because we're going to have some more announcements coming throughout the spring and summer you're not going to want to miss them but with that being said guys i hope everyone has a fantastic weekend stay safe out there and let's get into today's podcast Good morning, Dorch. How are you? I'm doing quite okay. Today, um, today I want to talk about the, one of the very first things that an archer needs to understand about their arrow and how to choose the correct arrow, and that is spine. So I want to get um, a little technical here and dive deep into spine, how spine can be manipulated through different processes, and um, how to choose the correct spine. Does that sound sound good to you? Well. I think what we need to do is what define that word, yes, because I think a lot of people do not understand, okay? The, the, the word spine is actually misused in so many ways because a lot of people thought, what, is, what, does, it, what, what does it mean by an arrow have a spine? I mean, just like we have a spine on our back, okay? The spine is defined as how the arrow going to be able to move because of the spine. And of course, you know, the arrow do not have a spine like us, but that is a theoretical and directional spine. That means anytime when you've got, a, you've got a structure, that is a place that structure can swing or move. And the way the structure swing and move is, is totally defined as a spine. So how does a tube have a spine? Now let, let's get back one step and, and talk about one of the most important fact or interesting fact. We human make a lot of structure in a tube form because we're talking tube form right now. Do you know that there's nothing out there that is a tubular form that makes to bend and it's actually a parallel tube? Hmm. Think about it. Your yeah. golf cart is a taper tube. Your pool kill is a taper tube. Fishing Your rod. fishing rod is a taper tube. Your golf club is a taper tube. And they are all meant to bend. But then arrow, it is not a taper tube. And you know, the critical factor of that is because every single one of those tubes that bend have an anchor point. Where is the anchor point of an arrow? The node. When you fly in the air. Would be the it node. Doesn't have one, isn't it? Doesn't have one. <laughs> but theoretically it does. I mean, the anchor point of an arrow when flex and launch is actually your knot and also your node. So theory, I mean, technically you can talk, define the same old way when you shoot an arrow. The handle of your fishing rod is like your knot. Your node is your power or what you call it, the power rating of the fishing rod, which is your node in the case of an arrow. So now after you learn, I mean, if you are into fishing, you know that when you build an arrow, the first thing you've got to build a fishing rod, the first thing is that you need to define the spine first or else, and then what kind of fishing rod is going to be? It's the same thing with an arrow. So, but the arrow is a lot more complicated because it doesn't have an anchor point. 
So the moment the error launch cycle is where you're going to base on whatever the first dynamic band of the shaft and how the reaction to the force is. That whole process, the first dynamic band plus the reaction to the shaft, that whole process is defined as the spine of an arrow. Now, this is where the complicated stuff is. As material and manufacturing process changed, we need to understand the, 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 the characteristic of a spine of an arrow always also changed. As the resistance to force from bending, that is called spine rating. Okay, what the, the way back then and Eastern have uh, uh, will, will come out and actually and then define what the spine rating is. And a lot of people may have forgotten it. Is that when we define the spine, I think it's about 1.92 pound because uh, they measured it wrong, okay? So it's defined as 20 inch support. And then you support a 1.92 pound weight in the middle. The amount of the sagging of the arrow in thousands is what a spine number is. So if you've got to say a 350 spine shaft, it's actually that shaft support over a 20 inch span. And then with a 1.92 pound of weight in the middle, the arrow will sag 0 0.35 inches or 350 thousandths of an inch. See, when you say 400 spine, that means 400 of thousands. The number is very, very small, okay, theoretically. But in cases of the, of course, in compound bow is small. In the case of recurve, the number is ginormous. So, but then we need to understand how the spine number and also the reaction, we need to separate the two. Because see, a spine reaction, you see how much will the arrow bend as you apply force to it. I mean, we went through about two episodes in the previous time about how the force is being applied. Just like a 70 pound pool in 65% off in a recurve and a compound and a high light off camp is totally different. Yep. Because the duration of force applied to the arrow at maximum power is different. I mean, if you, any one of you read magazines like a, like a bow, a bow hunter magazine or, or inside archery or anything on the technical side, you can see that. So that's definitely there. I mean, there's no denying it at all. So now the, the next question is that, what is the spine of a shaft looks like? I think this is where a lot of people got lost. In, in the old days, when, when shafts are made of aluminum and Eastern make most of them, it is very simple. It's a, it's a homogeneous material. It's extruded. And some people, and then of course, some of the materials is not just extruded, extruded and fold and weld and grind. So you can see the seam, but of course the newer generation is extruded straight out. So that's not a true seam, but since it's a homogeneous material, let me explain that word a little bit because a lot of people do not understand that. That means the material that comes out all technically, all molecular structure is facing the same direction because of an extrusion. So the material is pretty linear, which means that no matter how you cut the arrow shaft in case of an, a linear parallel aluminum shaft, we're not talking barrel shaft, we're talking a parallel aluminum shaft. No matter how you cut it, the spine of that shaft, that means which way it bends. It's a, for example, you find at four inch, it bends at 12 degrees, 12 o'clock. It can pretty much assume the entire arrow is gonna bend at 12 o'clock. Does it really bend all at 12 o'clock? Answer to this, no there's going to be a slight five to 10 degree variance. But if you find the spine is pretty linear, that means if you cut the arrow at, at 32, like 32 inch arrow, you cut it at 28. If you mark it at 12 o'clock, say of the shaft and all the way down, it pretty much will be the same. That's what the spine of an aluminum shaft do. When the first generation carbon shaft come out, which Beeman make those, they are also, guess what? Extruded mm -hmm. carbon shaft. What does extruded carbon shaft means? All fibers are linear. That means all facing one direction. Assuming the fiber is going horizontally from zero degree. So the moment you find the spine of that specific shaft, the, this time when I say spine, 
is based on when the F force being applied, which way the arrow will flex. The reason we say that because see, you think of think of arrow, you cross the arrow, cut the arrow in cross section. You need to think of the arrow as a clock, okay? At one point, the arrow is going to flex. Now, in case of a linear spine shaft, the arrow is going to flex from the height, from the lowest point, because that's the only thing that matters. A lot of people say, oh, we look for the high spine. No, the high spine is not what you need. The reason that in the old days, the high spine is quote unquote, that everybody looked for, because in a linear type spine, the high side, the opposite of the high side is the low side. Now things got a lot more complicated when you move to carbon. In the case of extrusion shaft, like the Beeman or some of the earlier or some of the deer crossing shaft are extruded. And we even see that in some of the element shaft, they do extrusion, which give them a lot of really good spine rating and which give them a linear spine. So what, I mean, that's great. So how come people don't keep on making it? Linear spine carbon shaft is extremely dangerous because the fibers are all linear. And, and then the moment the fiber was cracked, that's the reason, you know, just like even today, even with the best arrow, even the one that I made with two pad with what, more than five, six patterns on it, you just need to know that the arrow is in good shape because you are re relying. Just like if you've got a leaky suspension, do you want to go far hard with it? That pretty much is the bottom line. <laughs> so now that said, how do we overcome if you say the, the structural integrity of a shaft is, say, compromised? People say, oh, no, no, I don't come. No. Every carbon arrow, eventually the structure will be compromised. You just say that you have a suspension will last forever. No, that don't happen. It's simply some of design better to last longer, some less. That's the real deal. So let's go into a little bit deeper. What, how do we, why is spine so critical? And how come it seems don't matter much in, in some way? Remember, a lot of in the old days is pretty simple because you, you technically got aluminum arrow or simple a simple linear spine shaft. You turn the arrow, you tune the knot, you shoot through the you shoot through the paper, and you say, "Oh, it's good." The only thing you need to think about is your quote unquote air rest position, your knot position, and you get the thing to to tune right. And I I know of people who really want to do paper tune with an arrow. You need to use at least three arrows and hopefully they are all spine the aligned matched. Because you can be tuning the arrow rest when the spine is off, off on shaft. So you can tune all, I say, oh, this is now shooting perfect. Then you put a second arrow, the whole thing just goes to shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's how important the spine of a shaft when you tune and bow is. And a lot, you notice know, most people don't talk about that when we are talking 55, 65% level of recurve. Because see, you can pretty much shoot a target, I would say 20 yard on a pipe plate size if you are totally off spine at 55, 60% level. But if you really talk to the target shooters, those are the guys who call the upper and lower tens. Yeah. Right? So is a pie plate acceptable? <laughs> Not in that stage. Yep. So in other words, the behavior of the, 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 the need for understanding the behavior of the arrow when you shot, shoot it, it's a lot, it's a whole different level. I mean, just like me and you, we drive our car and put 40, 50, 40 to 50 to 70,000 miles before we change tires. In case of Formula One, they went through a container of tires in five days. Whew. So what does that said? It's those are wearable items, just like quote unquote your arrows, just Arby. like your knots. Yep. Why do they need that so critical? What's wrong with having our normal tires and run for the, I mean, an Indy 500 is no, it's only 500 miles. <laughs> it's nowhere 30, 40, 50,000 <laughs> that our car is good for. Well, the same thing with the level of competition the level of accuracy you demand. Precision, yeah. I mean, if you simply care, say, 20-yard pie plate, 
then this subject is really not for you. I mean, especially if you shoot the high FOC, thin arrows, 70 pound. I mean, what can I say? I mean, you really, you can shoot anything you feel like. <laughs> this subject is really tough. Sort of, what's the point? It's like people who don't, I mean, he go to India and just he run the first round, you can see himself, what? You don't need tires. <laughs> yeah. So now let's go into the spine based on aero construction, because this is where a lot of people misunderstood that. As I said, in the aluminum day, the spine is linear. In the Beeman days, extruded carbon fiber, the spine is also, I would say, reasonable linear. You're looking at maybe five, maybe maximum 10 degree off from the spine from one end to the other. But then in order to overcome the explosion and spurring of the carbon fiber, if I remember if my memory served me correctly, I didn't want to miss anybody. I believe Gold Tip is the first guy who do multi-layer carbon construction. So in other words, there's four or five layers of carbon. And the first layer say is pointing 15 degree to the left, second layer 15 degree to the right, third layer 30 degree to the right, and then 30 degree to the left, and maybe doing something like a five, 10, 15 degree based on the carbon fiber material. Now remember, those are linear carbon. They are not weave carbon. That means those carbon fiber all have one directions. Right. But if you offset layer direction of it, that means if when the carbon arrow break, you do you technically prevent the carbon fiber to forming a spur. In other words, you we do the same approach as we do temper glass. That means if you don't temper glass, the moment you break it, the glass come out with shards and sharp. The moment you temper it or overlay them. The first time you break the second layer of the carbon in the opposite direction will prevent the fiber from being continuous and a spur. So they break clean. Would a clean carbon arrow do damage to your hands? Absolutely. But it's a whole lot better than something like 50 freaking spur carbon fiber spur into your hand in random way. Now you've got one tube, you can remove it, and that's the end of it. The other one, you really need to do x-rays and so on to find out every single second shot that broke inside your head. It's a disaster. And that's the reason, you know, every single arrow out there, if you look at the arrow, there's always a label. Blacks before use, check your arrow for crack. Yes, that's basic stuff. It's like same single thing, even today. Every single race race day, you notice the guy walk the racetrack to make sure there's no debris, or the at least the, the airplane pilot will take the guy to make sure it's good because that's the basic stuff. If you go and shoot target all day long and group your arrow and you go and hunt it and you, and you don't check your arrow and say, How come the arrow break in the middle of the first shot? You ask for it. <laughs> yeah. Are there still I know arrows? It's not funny, but it's not. Are I there mean, still I arrows have... that are extruded today? Mm -hmm. Are there still arrows that are extruded today? Yes. Uh, so uh, the Beeman first layer, and so does the, uh, I believe that the Element Typhoon first two layers, are, I mean, first layer is still extruded. They just wrap it with the, uh, with the weave on it. Okay. It's a one to two ratio weave. I mean, I try to get myself involved, understand how each company build their shaft. Can I be wrong? Well, absolutely, because I don't run the manufacturing. I only see them based on, a very simple process. I usually, when I have arrow questions, I will throw them in about 420 degree off and I'll bake them, get rid of the resin and see the carbon construction. The, the, uh, the carbon construction for a lot of the Eastern shaft is actually a, a multi-directional carbon fiber weave. Very impressive. But then again, what is the final direction of the spine of all this multi-directional carbon layer and weave. You think it's linear? No, it's helix. Or in most cases, compound helix. And in cases of some manufacturer who do a slight, I mean a slight tapered on the mandrel. I mean, in the case of like element, I mean like some of the original uh, uh, trophy, tro uh, trophy uh, ticker arrows, they're about 3000 on a 204. So one side can be 206, the other side is a 203. Why do they do that? 
They do that because it's much easier to pull the mandrel out because it's tapered. You find that also in the case of uh, victory, they are also tapered. But about 1,000, it's not a lot. So the less you taper you have, the more lean, uh, the, the, the supposedly, the more parallel the shaft is. So that the, when you cut the shaft, you have less reaction of the result. Am, am I helping you to see? Because see, remember, we are trying to make sure every single arrow on the same batch is going to react the same. That's where the problem is. See, right now, I do learn one thing because initially I'm thinking no matter how you build an arrow, you need to solve uh, spine test each shaft. But I find out because the shaft is, is made based on the carbon fiber lay and carbon fiber is pretty linear on the fabric with the resin. So as long as the weight of that entire batch is very similar within one grain, the spine rating of the shaft of that batch is pretty much identical. Now the word identical is depends on how precise you want it to be. I mean, it's like when you do a $5,000 mode and you say this two uh, ethernet connector is the same. No, you do a $70,000 mode, you're getting close. <laughs> when you do a $120,000 mode now, they're identical now. But in what way? In usage. Sure. So in other words, those arrows will be identical in spine based on the usage we have today. Now, understanding when you do a spine, if you know the shaft is being a spiral spine or compound spiral, what do you do? This is where actually uh, I have this question back in 2008, because I really get into it because I, I originally believe that I can mechanically change a spine using arrow concept and I don't have to worry about the spine direction. Well, I was proven straight up wrong. The spine direction is so critical. The installation of an insert, the installation of the vein, the installation of the knot, the fuel point, the broadhead, the con shape of them, and the center of gravity of the design of the fuel point can all change the spine. They say, no, 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 100 grain is 100 grain. <laughs> no, 100 grain is not 100 grain. 100 grain fuel point, which is about, uh, I would say, a 0.8, minimum, a 0.8 inch long compared to a two inch long broadhead. The reaction of that 100 grain to the shaft which is the result of the spine is not the same. Which also make a lot of people say, well, you know, uh, I, why do you have to quote unquote, uh, tune your broadhead to your shaft, especially on the high speed bows and which is lighter, lighter arrow, I mean, lighter arrow. The reason for that, because at lighter arrow, the speed is up, the spine reaction is the dominant factor. The moment you increase your front of center, the spine is behaving like a noodle. It's no longer the dominant factor. And since the arrow is not flying very fast, the spine reaction of the vein that is at the end of the arrow shaft is also less because the speed is not there, which means the drag of aerodynamic coefficient to the vein is no longer as important. But then when you do a true 315 feet per second or above bow, the spine of the arrow becomes so critical because now you have aerodynamic factor. The direction of the vein, how much the weight the vein flaps is all riding on the shaft. So everything be exaggerated, become more important. And if the arrow really flaps so much, just like I remember a few episodes we talked about, when the arrow flexes, the arrow look like a tuna, look like a macro. What do you think that is? That's the resulting of the spine reacting. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, now, one thing that I want to um, 
kind of kind of talk about it. You mentioned a little bit about how you can manipulate the spine and what yes. what can happen. And um, Aero Concept does that, right? Aero Concept is something. Well, Aero that, Concept is one way to do it. We can manipulate spine in so many ways. First of all, we do we can manipulate spine based on uh, 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 based on viewpoint. Inside. The aspect ratio of the field point. Yes, also the weight of the viewpoint. Sure. In other words, you're changing the front of center, which means that how much weight is the uh, is the arrow reacting to it? Okay. I mean, for example, like I mean, in in the old way of thinking, you can lower the spine by increasing the weight of the point, or you can add weight to the back and de and increase the spine of and increase the spine of shaft. So those are what they are talking is the result, the result of the doing the job. Sure. Not what actually happened. In other words, just like how do I say it? We balance tire by adding weight to the edge. The tire did not change. Yep. It's the behaving of adding that weight, the tire changed. Okay. Does that make more sense? Yeah, yeah. So um uh, something that I saw in a forum that I wanted to ask you about was something we talk a lot about in having a well-performing arrow is the reaction time and the mm -hmm. amount the amount of time that the arrow spends flexing and how much it flexes through the air mm -hmm. what is it a bad is it bad practice to just shoot a stiffer spine to reduce the reaction absolutely not that is actually the simplest thing to do okay. the reason that people don't do that because the stiffer spine you instantly give you a weight penalty but then how do you overcome it? We did that in fishing. Increase the modulation of carbon so that you can use less material and still get stiffer spine. But you also run the possibility of getting a more brittle shaft sure. because the higher the modulation, the more brittle the material is. Okay. I mean, the same thing with, high, with, with ultra high tensile spring steel. They're great, but you can't work with it. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's like in the case of, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of advertising. In the case of the uh, arrow weave, we use the highest modulation linear carbon, but that's on layer two. The layer one, layer three, and layer four is just to bear, to protect layer two. That's it. So how come an arrow weave is so much heavier? Because all three layers of weave is to protect layer two and layer two only. So layer the two layer is pretty one, brittle. Because it's so brittle. So we prevent the thing from, from going outside. We prevent the arrow from talking. Now, that's another thing. I'm going to go back. The first, the first beam and arrow comes out. It, the spine is pretty linear. But what prevents it from having torsion when you flex it? That was one of the things that nobody in archery really sees. And a lot of people say, oh, this arrow, when I shot it, now, let, let's put it this way. When the arrow turns out of the bow, there's three factors. The first factor is how the surfing and the string interact. Okay? The second factor is how the arrow shaft itself on the spine have torsion. That's number two. Okay. And number three, how the vein interact with air. That's number three. So the moment when the arrow is leaving the knack, that specific moment, the serving is number one. When the arrow is flexing that moment, torsion. is the torsion. When the arrow leaves the bow, leaves the string in front of the riser. Veins. The vein is number three. Yeah, we saw that happen in a lot of our high-speed testing. and. Um... We noticed that different arrows would do different things because of the spine, like because of the spine. And the serving and the vein, because see, the higher the speed it is, the, the more important is the vein. But then the vein will only work if the arrow is spinning straight. The, memo, the moment the arrow with the heavy FOC and the tail is flapping, the entire aerodynamics is out the window. That's no longer the important factor. You just got a freaking flapping parachute. Yes, sure. a flapping parachute. And at that point, it's super slow anyway. Right. 
So if it, I mean you're shooting below 260, so it doesn't matter. And which is which is a lot of my customer. You really see them. They say, "Oh, I, I, I'm shooting so much better with this." Just like another customer texted me, "I'm shooting a 570 grain arrow on a helium with a with a 29 inch draw 70 pound." Why? <laughs> hey, if that's what you can make to shoot right, I mean, just ask. I mean, just like. I remember the old movies like Revenge of the Nerds. They are going down to Florida, setting the cruise control at 45 miles per hour. They would not get an accident. They all can sleep very well. There's less movement. There's no wind noise. I agree with all of them. But if I'm going to Florida, I'm going to go that fast. <laughs> I will set my cruise control at around 70, legally. <laughs> George likes to go fast. No, when, I mean, I, I, I do have some... Sp- Triple the just beating tickets in my earlier life. <laughs> but so that, that's a diff, that's a different day when we when we can talk about it with a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully here in a couple of weeks at Harrisburg. Yeah, um, definitely. So the, the back to my uh question with like just shooting a, a stiffer spine, the downside to that obviously is weight, but also when you have the reaction of an arrow of an overspined arrow, what, how does that negatively impact the arrow flight? It does, it does not. You really do not. Even through, can, like, when you, is there a point in which, like, you're just too overspined? Is what I'm getting at. No, nope, not okay. when you should come on bows. Okay. It only matter when you should recurves because you're using the arrow to tune the bow. In the case of a compound bow, that's nothing called too stiff or too high spine, or too large of an arrow. Okay. That's something that it takes me a long time to recognize the fact. Because he, I think, well, you know, you'll be too much for the arrow, you'll be too stiff. Okay, what does too stiff do? It makes the arrow recover faster. Okay, is that a bad thing? No. Yeah. It makes the arrow out of oscillation faster. It's a good thing. So the only thing bad is weight. So if you're able to use an ultra high modular carbon, and we also already know based on tube dynamics, the larger the shaft, the faster the recover, the lighter the material. What does that mean? You want to shoot the largest diameter arrow with the highest spine you can get away with, with the lightest weight. Okay. That's the bottom line. Yeah. But that is not what most people want to hear. No, everyone wants to go the opposite, at least on the, the arrow size. Right. I mean, because see, everybody thinks, oh, this arrow penetrates so much better. At the end of the day, what's, what's cutting the animal? It's your broadhead. Yeah. So how small a broadhead you want to use? And when you, when you get into uh, reaction time, when you're talking about a thinner um, diameter shaft, you have the, the wall the wall thickness, mm-hmm. which is going to slow down the reaction. Correct. The thicker the wall, the slower the reaction because you've got memory effect. Yep. So if you Can have... you overcome this, something like this? Answer is absolutely yes. I mean, just like everything that's positive and negative, but the negative side is that in the case of thinner arrow, it costs so much more. And then you have, you need so much. The cost is not about money. It's not just about money. It's about effort. I would very confidently tell you with the fine, with the fine knock, uh, stalker arrow concept system on the 166. I solved all the problem with the 166. But the question is that do you really want to spend no less than $320 on a dozen arrow on components before you put labor in it? That's just on components. Correct. Now you can get the same effect on a Goatee Pro Hunter. Well, right, Goatee Hunter, Goatee Hunter or Hunter Expedition for under 100 bucks. That two arrow will about fly the same, same speed with everything on it. But they're gonna that's where a re, that's where you quote unquote, you need to think through. Okay, I want that shape. I want that form. It's not like people want a carbon fiber spoiler for their car and make sure they didn't paint it. Will that react about the same as aluminum? I would say 90% yes. But they will pay three times as much for the carbon because it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, you your money. And we happen to live in America. You should about do what you like. 
Just like if you really like the 166 shaft and you really want to match the performance of a 246 and you don't mind spending the money and learning how to do it right, it can be done. Absolutely, because I prove it. I, I devoted a lot of my effort and no less than four patterns on the 166. I got it done. As, as a matter of fact, you run 66, the cheapest way to do it, just throw my arrow out there and throw the 166 tubing in it. You're good. You're golden. You, you make the 166 behave more like a 246 already. And yes, the 166 will be more durable because the because wall is thicker. Wall thickness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you also sacrifice on reaction time. And not to mention when people talk about wind drift, that's another misconception. The spine have a lot to do with the wind drift. Again, Explain that. See, when the spine is having a lot of memory, was flying through the air for the first 20 something yards, the tail of that arrow where the vein is, with the flapping around the wind drift, the, what do you call it? The crosswind signature of that shaft is ridiculous. We're talking 12, 15 inches. Yeah. On a one Now, if the arrow able to recover and go into a small, a tight elliptical spin, the entire crosswind signature of the arrow is under about inch and a half. Big. You tell me if I got a parachute that's an inch and a half wide compared to a parachute that's 12 inch wide, which one will have more effect on crosswind? If you can't figure that out, man, we have nothing to talk. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to listen to this. You need to start simply start, start making some parachutes with, with, the, with, with, the, with, with warm up back and strings. Get that thing off your mind first before we talk further. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a very big misconception, and I don't think uh, you and I together have enough of a presence to change consumer behavior on that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 a terrible, terrible um, misconception that that, and I guess it's just I don't think people are lying necessarily. I just don't think they know. Right, because see what they think about is say, oh, look at that shaft, so much thinner. When the wind blow on it, you have less effect, less surface area. Right. But what you need to think about is the wind as a single plane. Imagine this, you're shooting through paper. The 166 arrow and the 246 and the 380 size arrow, when you shoot through paper, then draw a circle on it. What do you think the difference is? If the arrow is a type of legal plane, that size is, is pretty much neglectable. Yeah. Because remember, you the arrow, you need to think of the arrow as a media going through a media of air. And that media is moving. Yes, the thinner the shaft, the easier the water to move. But if the shaft is flexing, the size is no longer a concern. The, the area the shaft covers as it moves is a concern. Yep. And I think one of the things, even when I first heard you talk about that, um, it did I didn't quite, I didn't quite fully understand it. Cause my question was always like, okay, well, if you take a 246 or a 204 and a 166 and they're all 300 spine, they all take the same amount of effort to bend the same amount. And if you mm -hmm. have a, a constant, whatever, 70 pounds, mm -hmm. they're all, they're all going to bend as much, but the difference is how quickly they are done flexing. Correct. And how long the flex area of that shaft how much area is it cover? When you make think about it, just like imagine yourself holding, say, uh, a ruler, and you flex the ruler. The faster you recover, the less effort it is on your hand. Yep. The longer it flexes, the more effort is in your hand. In other words, the amount of area that flex is covering is what the crosswind signature is. And that's where the ring drifting come by. I mean, you notice a lot of guys say, oh, let me put a tiny, tiny veins on it. Oh, you shoot so much better. Because when the arrow flexes, you just lower the size, of, you shrink the size of the parachute. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> so the effect is not so bad. I mean, just like people use uh, tiny gateway feathers on the, on, the, on the 166, they say, oh my God, the arrow shoots so much better. Because the thing is not doing anything anymore. It's feathers, yeah. <laughs> And then when you low, if you low enough speed, when you're small enough, aerodynamics is not a factor. Drag is not a factor. If that's not a factor, then that's, of course, there's no factor. Sure. Then the directional control is in it. Well, remember, heavy FOC with a spine. 
you really got solid directional control because all the weight is on one point. Mm -hmm. It's like throwing a rock with a string. If you've got a soft, a big enough rock, I don't care how long the string is, the string is following. Now you imagine you've got a stick on the string when you go out of it. Now the whole thing changed. Yep. Now the bigger the rock, the better. That's yeah, the same thing with FOC. Yeah. Yes, it has to be. But then you only got so much power. As you increase the weight, power to weight ratio again. Just like, how do I say it? You've got a Honda Accord, 1,700 pounds, 1,800 pounds. Then you've got two buddies that's 400 pounds sitting on the back seat, and you're going to do rally. That <laughs> freaking engine will be laboring. <laughs> then you've got two of my buddy's girlfriend, like 90 pounds each. Ooh, the car fan goes beautifully. What just happened? It's the same engine, same more, car, same driver. More balance. Different payload. So how much payload do you want your arrow to have? Or people would say, oh, the broadhead give me such penetration, give me such luck, luck power and so on. I don't disagree, it, it sure did. But if you misjudge a 32 yard for a 35 yard, the arrow won't make it. Yep. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, I remember my Expedition Eccentric SD when I tuned it, tuned it good. I can have up to 37 yard one pin. If I aim at the top of the heart, I would kill all of them. Yeah, that's really incredible. Yeah, but you know, I'm pushing to the extreme and I don't, I don't expect people to do that because I spent freaking like four months tuning that bow. I'm doing every single trick I know to mankind to do that. <laughs> but that's yeah. fun. I mean, that's a, what you call it is a technical tour, a technical challenge, proof of concept. Oh, yeah. If I do, I mean, is the bow shootable? For me, it is before my shoulder surgery. It is really, I mean, I remember I shot that bow and killed that buck in Kickapoo with the with pole. It was so fun. The bow, the, the D is about 34 yard. I was shooting three arrow at the D at the fourth one. I killed it. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. I shot the first arrow at the back of his head. Go down. The deer don't know I shot it. Then I shot an arrow right in front of the chest. He didn't know I shot it. Then I say, okay, I'm going to just rattle with it. I shot it just above his head. He didn't see it. <laughs> yep, finally say, okay, it's time to die. And then I shot it. And then next thing you know, if you look at my Facebook post back in, I think it's what, 1990, or 2004, by 2014, you can see the edge of my tree stand and the deer behind me. I shot it, it walked about 30 yards, died. So, what am I really trying to tell you is that, again, controlling the spine, controlling the vein, controlling the broadhead and all the elements, you are making an arrow that will fly in air with no sound. That's... Yes, the spine with the vein is one of the biggest sound producer besides the broadhead. Which are, are because we, the broadhead we... sound is very metallic. Mm -hmm. A weaker spine is going to produce more sound? Absolutely. No, no, no. The bow with the weaker spine will produce the most amount of sound. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how arrow concept changes everything that we're talking about here. Well, actually, that would, let me go back to again. I, I remember I talked about this. Is that when, when Jim Cam come with his corporate RDT 165 shooting a 420 feet per second? The only arrow, the only arrow in the market is the go to laser two. There's no other crossbow arrows. All the other crossbow arrows are a joke. And that's the time that I say, well, you know, if the arrow is too sharp, let's leave it. In other words, simply the simple concept, like increase the wall thickness, but I don't want to penalty by weight. Then I learn a lot. I learn a lot, a lot. First of all, just putting a tube inside behind the insert, you're going to crack the shaft because as the arrow bend, the inner tubing and the inserts are bombarding to each other. And eventually that area where the insert butted to the shaft in the inner shaft is where the arrow cracked. So I overcome it by using the arrow, uh, arrow insert H hybrid system, a double shoulder. So I put the first tube into the shoulder of the insert and then glue the entire arrow into the shaft. So that that part that flexed and bombarded between the insert and the carbon is eliminated. 
then I learned a lot. I mean, all the different glue don't work because original I try to glue it with super glue, thinking that I flow the super glue in it. Well, I end up with layer separation, the arrow above 10 to 15 shots, every arrow behave differently. You know why? The glue give differently. So the spine of the arrow on every single arrow is different. Different, yeah. Because I am no longer able to consistency of the shaft. So of course, under that, I call my good buddy, uh, Henry up in, uh, uh, up in uh, New Hampshire and discover about glue usage. We end up with using one of the Hanko's uh, ultra slow set epoxy. The molecular structure of that is, is significant. You are talking the longest carbon chain I know that can build inside a glue, which give it a very, it give me close to a 2C penetration into each fiber. That means the glue is holding 4C together. So what does that really do? Being a long carbon chain and having glue, you have two dissimilar material. See, originally, I would tell you, I, I using a gold tip laser tool, I put in a gold tip hunter, 300 spine, 10 and a half inch in the shaft. Inside so the, the laser tube. Inside the shaft. So the arrow is 22 inch. I try to not go over that 45% mark because the moment you go before that, the entire the entire fish formation no longer exists. So if you were to go with a 12 inch shaft, you exceed of... the 12. If you exceed that, then the the break point is no longer there. You 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 are dealing with at that moment that 12 inch and the insert and the fuel point. All that 13 14 inches become the fuel point. Oh, okay. Okay. Not entirely because it's carbon, but it yeah. behaves like that. Sure. So that's the reason when I write my pattern. I don't want to overstep my boundary instead of putting a shaft in it. And I also know some people do that, but they did not. See, the most important part of the pattern is the shaft with the glue. Okay. The glue is what makes the difference. And the next reason that glue is like $1,200 a freaking gallon. The two set, the two part epoxy is $1,200 a freaking two gallon jug. Wow. It's a very, very expensive process. And you need to, you need to be mixed in aluminum foil. And you need to fix, you need to mix them about ideally above 72 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the reason you notice in my office on my fudging table, there's a heater underneath the table to keep the entire environment around 70 to 75 degrees. We got that too. Yep. You make a big difference, isn't it? If yep. you go below 70 degrees, the, the, the glue, the epoxy, when you mix it, will become grainy, which you will not do the, and you do the even flow then the coverage is not there. Then you got uneven layer separation. Then every arrow will shoot the same, shoot differently. Because you, because see the layer separation. Now, what you really want to do is that with the arrow concept part is that in the case of a 246 or a 300, you figure that by adding six inches to it, it's, it's using 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8, depends on the outside shaft. What does it mean that you say, if you've got a 30 inch shaft, you put a six inch in it. In the most cases, six times 0. 0.8 is 4.8. That 30 inch shaft is going to behave like it was a 25 inch shaft. So what do you just mean by that? Because see what happened is that I, I now decrease the angle of flex. In other words, I'm looking at the flex magnitude. That means, the entire spine of the shaft. Remember, in the old days, the only way to overcome the spine is to increase modulation of the carbon or increase the diameter. So the arrow will restrict, will, will react, well, will re resist more to the flex. Now, the moment put arrow concept in it, the fun part which the arrow need to flex the most, where the node is, the angle of flex decreased by 600% to start with which caused the magnitude of flex in the midsection significantly decrease. Well, that's on the first band. So what happened to the second band? The second band, instead of flexing the tip on the node, is now flexing the entire arrow concept. All of a sudden, because of the node is now, not the node is wider, the no is actually more forgiving because the angle is narrower. No, angle is much wider. Depends on which way you look at it. Yeah. You now having a much more forgiving arrow, a much more faster recovery arrow. 
Can you put a tube that is, say, a 30 inch, a 30 inch straw, put a 12 inch tube in the front and 12 inch tube in the back? Answer is absolutely. That is a fantastic idea. Guess what? It cannot be done easily. Why? Yeah, that's my question. How do you able to teach a carbon tube to flow with the glue for 12 inches? We find out based on cutting open on other testings, seven and a half is about max. Six is guaranteed. Inches. Inches long. In the so front and the back? Each side. Yeah. Because we are gluing it in. Yeah. Of course, if you don't glue correctly in the front, you've got some glue not perfect. Where's the carbon tube go? It's going to go into the insert and it's going to stop it. That's error concept 1.0. But then when you put the glue, put the tube on the back, all the way in, what's holding the tube from going forward? Nothing. Nothing except the glue. So how do you guarantee when you put the inner tube, when you put the tube into the shaft, six inch deep minus the, the knock or minus the fine knock, now you're pushing that thing close to about eight inch into the shaft. How do you guarantee there's glue all the way around from the front to the back? You can't. Can you do it? Absolutely. You require a lot of effort. That's where anybody who want Aero Concept 2.0, really want it. You need to find a good certified and trained fine art dealer who have done a lot of this, not just once or twice. Because what you need to do is that you need to raise the temperature, this time all the way to 75 and more. You need to chamfer the carbon tube. You need to put the glue in the tube first and put the glue on the tape and you push the tube using the chamfer to follow and continues to flow the glue. Then you have to use an eight inch cotton swab to get the glue that's excess off and clean the inside. So when people tell you they build you a dozen of Aero Concept 2.0 and charge you 110 bucks to build it, that's why they're not making real money. Yeah, they do it of labor of love because they know this is the best out there, but it is not an easy build. Conceptually, it's beautiful. That's the reason I told most customers stay with Aero Concept 1.0 or at least let some dealer build it for you first. Because the having tube in the front, in the back, imagine you've got a 31 inch gyro, three inches fine. You put a six inch tube in the front, you put a six inch tube in the back. How long, is the, how long is the effective of that 300 spine? Say it's a 30 inch arrow. You're down to 20 inch arrow shaft, isn't it? Yeah. What does 20 inch 300 spine we able to support? An 80 pound 32 inch draw. Because you and your spine theoretically is down to 200 spine now. <laughs> okay, yeah, that, yeah, that's what I was, I was wondering how much stiffer it makes that. Yeah, very simple, you, you, you see? But then there's another problem. At the end of a day, that is still a 300 spine shaft. That is 20 inch long. So that is the weakest point, which in this case is the weakest link. The middle. Right. So at the end of a day, the weakest point of the shaft based on spine is what the actual arrow or the safety factor is. I mean, just like I got a few challenging customer who want to shoot 80 pound Bowtech Allegiance with a 400 spine shaft and shooting 385 feet per second. Yes, they got it. The arrow will fly right. If I, oh, it was the fastest arrow I ever shot. You'll penetrate anything. I understand that. I mean, That's some people like limits. to do Russian roulette. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, it's okay. I mean, I, I'm not against it. So I'm not involved. <laughs> That's pushing the limits there. Yes, but you know, people say, oh, I'm, 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 I want to push the limit. Yes, go for it. But just know what you're, I mean, this is a free country. I mean, you can do anything you want to, but just don't make me reliable for what you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because first of all, I do not recommend it. I will not recommend it. I will not make it for you. I won't even build the arrow for you. I won't. Yeah. I can't imagine. That's a liability I can't afford to hold. <laughs> I can't imagine what that arrow is doing in the air. Yeah, but they will tell you the penetration. They also will tell you 
They also forgot to tell you when they try to shoot the arrow at say 20 yards, the arrow is going to attack us so at an angle. I mean, with that arrow, if you will really shoot it, you better flex your arrow every freaking time when you recover it. Yeah. I'll be so afraid of it. Oh yeah, that's not for me. Um, so with just try to try to give me some numbers here. We'll use 30 inch shaft for um mm-hmm. for the purpose of this conversation, but Arrow Concept 1.0 on a 350 spine shaft. How much mm-hmm. stiffer does that make it? You figure that you, you, you technically can uh, you can uh, you technically can reduce the spine by no less than 300, 30. So okay. the two three fifty will behave more like a three twenty. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then so for then you add Arrow Concept 2.0 to that same shaft, and it's more like a two hundred. No, more like a uh, 300. Okay, so it'll do an, a, another 30. About, but remember, 20, 30 per 30 in arrow is not equal to 50, 60. It's about 50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so, you still have the original same section. Yep. Okay. So you can manipulate spine by 50. Yeah, but, but at the same time, yes, you can. Let me 1.0 to 2.0, you can do, I would say around 30 to 50, depends on how far you want to push it. But at the end of the day, the midsection of arrow shot is still the same. Still spine. the weakest, weakest point. Right. Because see, when you're bending, you simply the the magnitude of bending, the bending still exists. I'm just lowering the magnitude of the fax. Remember, when the arrow flexes, you need to think about it. When the arrow bend, how far is the arrow bending away from the center? That's called the magnitude. Okay. Yeah. You want to reduce the magnitude as much as possible. But remember, the arrow is still resisting the same amount of force. Yeah. It's just a, because the arrow concept lower the magnitude. It do not change the spine of the arrow. It only changes the spine behavior Reaction. of the, the arrow. Yep. Okay. So um, how much faster recovery time arrow concept? Oh, that's, one, that's about 600%. <laughs> on 1.0? <laughs> yes. And then 2.0? 2.0 is you add another 20% on top. So, in other words, in the case of which we have, when Dave Murray, when Vital Emma did the video, we can see that. A normal 18 yard is dropped to about nine feet in recovery Recovery time. That's That's a 600% improvement. Yeah, that's incredible. And in the case of AeroConda 2.0, we are talking about six to seven feet recovery time. No, I mean, you guys got the high-speed camera. You play with it. You saw it. I mean, it's not something that I make up because it, when it comes out, I say, wait a minute, in percentage, right? That's close to 600%. That's a, that's a big number. Yeah. And that's on a 246 shaft? No, that's on a 300. On a 300. And then that number because, is... Because back then, I mean, just like, you know, uh, just like Pro Holder Archery, they, after all the arrow... This year, all the all the vertical boat that you go, they're gonna go with the arrow weave 300, 200, 300, 400, 300, 350, and 300, 300. Because yeah. see, with all the new compound boat coming out, if you really want the maximum penetration, speed, all the rest, the 300, 300 size shaft is gonna be your cream of the crop. Yep. Except people say, oh my God, you look like a 2219. Yes, it is the same size. It's 2264 <laughs> OD. <laughs> yeah, they but, look like dinosaurs. Yeah, but you know what? If I gonna have a pet toy that listen to me 100, percent do you want a freaking what Ryler or a T Rex? I want a T Rex all day as long as he listens. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. And that 300, <laughs> that T Rex is gonna be a lot cheaper. Not really. I mean, yes, it should be cheaper to build. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. And then not to mention because the 300 is a true 300. Yeah. See, everybody's 300 except carbon. Uh, carbon tech is not a 300, it's a 305. Every single, oh no, and, and carbon tech's uh, badger, that's a 303. Everyone on this planet is a 300. That means you can buy a 300 insert on a 300 size shaft. Components are a lot easier. A lot more consistent. But the moment you go into 246, it's not 246, it's from 242 all the way to 247. And a 204 is from 201 to 207. It is, I mean, 166 is okay, but remember how small that is. It's 1645 to 1665. That's time. If you look at the percentage, I mean, you start doing calculation and then with the fitting percentage wise, you notice 
the, the 204 is about the worst it gets. Yeah, yeah. Because you're close to two and a half, no, close to three percent variance. That's hard to get components. And, and, and the 300 is zero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, zero is a very beautiful number. If you're, if you're an engineer, you love that. But that's none. <laughs> Does, yes, it doesn't happen. <laughs> exactly. But then can you make it happen? I mean, yes, anytime you can make it happen, as long as you make the components. You, you custom fit the component on machine to that. Sure. Okay, one, one more question on, on Spine here. So uh, listening to the last podcast, like one of the first podcasts we did, we talked about finding the first dynamic bend mm -hmm. and finding the weak point in the arrow. And mm -hmm. you mentioned that there's going to be multiple valleys on mm -hmm. a lot of arrows. And you said mm -hmm. some arrows will have set up to seven Yes. Weak points on the arrow. Can you explain that process and why that happens? Well, see what happened. You said, imagine this. Remember, we're talking multi layer or, or in the case of a uh, extruded arrow. When you extrude it, the arrow fibers are all linear. So, where is the weakest when you rotate it? When you, when you rotate an extruded piece, unless it's performed perfectly, some area on one side is kind of more resin compared to carbon, right? Yep. So if you have, say, if you have one area have less resin and more carbon and get more carbon, that will be the weakest point, isn't it? Yep. So how do you guarantee there's not two points of that that's the have less resin? Resin. Remember, car carbon is what resists. Yep. Resin do not have that. Resin is a filler. So how do you guarantee? That is no, the carbon 100% evenly distributed. Okay. Now, in the case of a multi layer carbon with a directional lay, remember every single layer you start is the higher, the, the outer the layer, the larger and longer the fabric because the larger diameter, the more material. So if you say the first one you use, say one layer, but two layers going 15 degrees to the left. So theoretically, this arrow shaft will talk left, right? Because all the fiber is turning left. Yep. So the second layer go on top is turning 15 degrees to the right. So does the first layer cancel the second layer? Theoretically, but it does not because the outer layer is bigger than the inner layer. Uh, okay. So what happened to the spine? Follows the result that. of this two layer is sort of in the middle, but skewed towards the right. right. Because the right layer is bigger. Then you throw, say in the case of four layer, you throw a 30 degree to the left for the third layer. Then you throw a 30 degree to the left. So what's your result? <laughs> that means you have zero concept what the result is what you're looking for is the resulting band. Under all this layer, what is it going to do to the arrow shaft? The only way to find it is to test it. Yeah. Because you can't base on your reaction or marking a layer. You cannot, because you don't know from different layer, from different, uh, different fabric, from different rows of carbon fiber, from different factory, they will cause speed, there will be variance. And then as simply from one batch of layer to the other, it's going to be variance. When you're making different temperature, you're going to be, be various, different moisture with variance. So that means if you buy a dozen arrow five years ago and you buy another like, last six months ago and buy another six months, and if they're not in the same production batch, different, they will be slightly different. Different, they weight the same and with the same, same spine rating. Because at that moment, your first the first dynamic band. Now this is where it gets tricky, because we've got multi-layer carbon. Okay, you got the weakest point, say at twelve o'clock. Then people talk about, oh, you're going to going through the neutral plane. The highest point will be on the six o'clock, right? No, it's not even a seven or eight. Those are the second weakest point because air will flex between the two weakest. So the old day of thinking the highest spine is on the aluminum shelf on 12 o'clock, the, weak, the weakest of 12, the highest will be on six o'clock. That is sort of right because it's linear. But oh, in the yeah. case of carbon, it's gonna flex between the two weakest length, which means imagine if your weakest second band point 
is at say five o'clock. The arrow is not gonna, then you cannot draw a line between seven and uh, 12 and, and six and five because it's an arc. So how does the arrow flex? It flex in the elliptical form. Yeah, and, I remember you drew that picture for us when we were at Right, but then you use even more complicated. It's the front to the back on the same plane. Oh, the helix. So the first helix spine and the second helix spine, are they opposite exactly, say, about 160 degrees of art? No, <laughs> they're not. And now you know how, unless, I mean, even you got to, even when you got nuclear physics background, when you look at this, it's like, this is a freaking mechanical engineering nightmare. <laughs> yeah. The more you know it, the more you say you can't, you can't possibly control it. So instead of looking for how to calculate it, the best thing is that we look at the final result and react with it. Test it, yeah. That's the reason I invented the PAPS and now give you, okay, this arrow, when you launch it, this is where you off the arrow shaft, off the arrow rest, the direction of arrow is gonna bend this way. So, uh, and, uh, wait a minute, they say, well, but you don't need control the arrow when you launch it. I say, excuse me, when the arrow is off the boat, what kind of control do you have? None. So what are you talking about? <laughs> you can't control something you can't control. <laughs> The only control you have is when the arrow actually launch off the shaft. That's the only control you got. And which is why when you're dealing with a carbon arrow, the, the spine of a carbon arrow, except the arrow, arrow with, I, 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 when I understand it, I mechanically engineer the shaft to have linear. That's the reason I say the arrow weave, you got a single layer in it on the layer number two is 100% linear. All the rest is to prevent it from blowing up. That's the reason I will guarantee a linear spine. That's a very expensive process. Let me give you an idea. To build an arrow weave shaft, you require a person who are lucky to get four dozen a day done on the press. Wow. That's the reason it's so expensive. But then if you do an extrusion shaft, if you do something like uh, two yards per, uh, about 18 inch per second, how many error can you make? So hard. Yes, <laughs> exactly. When you do a basic mandrel row, like Carbon Express did or like a uh, tip did, you just bam, 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 bam. Those comes out fast because they all can mechanically done. Because see, when you're doing with a true multi-layer directional lay with control of direction, it takes a lot of effort because see, when you're off by say two, three degrees, the arrow will no longer flex right. So, and you make the arrow, you look at it. If the carbon fiber is not 100%, 180 degree, 90 degree, that's considered junk for yeah. me. Yeah. But that's what everybody's doing. <laughs> that's a fantastic arrow, the arrow weave. I know that, but I mean, to be fair, if I went through the normal channel, the arrow weave 204, giving the same margin everybody want, I would have to charge $480 a dozen. Nobody would buy it, buy it. No, yeah. I mean, if you look, ask anybody, use one and a half K, four K material, they look at you funny. Yeah. Because see, compared to, an, let me give you some step so you understand the pricing, okay? A normal linear resin, assuming that is, I would just use a number, a hundred, okay? The one and a half K, four K is 350. And 1K, 4K on the 166 is about 500. That's the starting point. And then the 1.5K, 5K, 1.5K compared to the original, say, $100 fabric, you need to use five to six times as much. First of all, it's 500% more expensive, and you need to five to six times more. Yeah. Okay? And the, the, the people need to understand when you buy carbon fiber, it's by the yard, not by weight. So when you buy 1K, 4K, the yard is 500% more expensive, but you need to use four to five to six times as much because they are so much thinner. That's but you insane. also play with the average. Yeah. Because now instead of like in you know, the traditional four, six layers, you think about each layer now have four to five rows on it you are playing with a very serious average. So all the, all the what you call it, all the, uh, uh, what you call it, 
characteristic of what you look for is going to be there. Now, that thing said, knowing how the spine behaves, that's the reason when you understand every single carbon arrow shaft is a spiral spine. That's another thing. Depends on how the material is built. The, first of all, when I'm going to tell you, a carbon cannot be, the spine of a carbon arrow cannot be shot out. is a lie. Yeah. It'll the carbon out. itself would not have any degradation. The, the degradation is on the resin. So yes, when you start shooting out extra large diameter arrow, because the flat is so much more significant because the wall is so much thinner, which is reason they don't last as long. Yes, those arrow will have the best performance when they are brand new. As time goes on, their performance will degrade. Some companies do better than others. Absolutely. Because they use better, the, the, the compression process is better control of temperature, better control of, uh, of pressure on the rolling process. In the case of Eastern, they got really, really, really technical uh, individual fiber control. I mean, just like their, their access, nano access is a beautiful process. But, you know, they are, they are truly an, a leader in linear aero production. Yeah. So if you go there and say you, uh, you want an arrow that's 100 feet long, it's doable. But with, with, the, with the production like when, what, East, what, what Gold Tip, me, or Black, Black Eagle, or all the rest of the industry, that's the small dollar here, anything over 36 inches is tough because you're going to make a long, much longer press to deal with it. Yeah. And the case of my arrow, because the fabric is so much longer, the press has to be much more wider. Yeah. Because you know, when you roll it on the mandrel, when you go thinner material, the material has to be larger. So the press has to be longer. And the alignment of the press and the pressure control has to be much more difficult. Now, what all this means, what we are trying, what the industry and including myself, we're trying to do is give you an arrow to behave as much as it can of an aluminum chef. <laughs> Yes, we are trying to replicate aluminum, aluminum. shaft. Yeah. But aluminum shaft with the right spine is only good for 70 shots. It's it breaks down. Then you, then you go into metal fatigue and you no longer have any spine that you look for. You'll go down from there. Yeah. I mean, no, no, I can talk hours on spine because this is a really a very complicated subject. It is more physics than most people want to deal with, and it's more theory in it. The more you dig into it, the more complicated, the more how do you call it, the more understanding you need it. The more you find out, the more you find out you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so true in this subject. I mean, just like every time I thought that I find it, I end up a whole new stack of things. Okay, how am I going to overcome this problem? Yeah, that's a how many years? That's a fourteen-year process and I'm still I'm getting close I'm still perfecting it that's crazy well but the, but the more you know the more you don't know the more <laughs> you find out what you need then you find out none of them is working <laughs> that should not, be the not, title of this podcast the more you know the more you don't know <laughs> <laughs> well it, it, it is the fun thing about it if, it if you I mean just like people thought they know about bullets no some people just simply overturn everything they know what four years ago and we're still learning more about it yep all right george well i think that that should cover at least the, for the the basis of spine um i have a, a better understanding there were some things that i just was on the edge about so I, I have a better standing i hope everyone that listened does too um do you have any concluding remarks here george well first of all you need to understand the higher the let off you use a bow, the higher the front of center you have, the more important. The, no, the higher the let off, the lighter the weight, the more important the spine is. The higher the let off, the less, the more the weight, the less important the spine is because you don't have the speed. Yep. That's the reason with the high let off bow, with a high speed bow today, if you want to shoot a really high efficient arrow, you need to find somebody who really understands arrow. Because I'm not joking. If you really, really know how to build it, like one of my, like Double Archery, I mean, he did a fantastic job. A few of his customers kicking deer at 120 yards without blinking an eye. No, it's not a joke. 
and uh, maybe one of these days I'll pull in, pull him in because he built ultra long range arrow because all his customers just love that because see during late season no deer walk next to the wood they all walk sixty yard to a hundred yard from the freaking wood so yeah. what do you do you shoot them yeah <laughs> that makes sense all right my friend. All right, Dorch. Well, thank you for spending some time with me here today. Uh, you enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good new year and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk to you next week.